Okay, good. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, good, good evening, evening, Doc. Okay. So, um, I'm coming. Let me take the attendance and then we can start. I'm taking attendance, so sorry. Just a minute. Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. Then give me one. Okay. They're playing three. All right, so good evening once again. So this evening, we good want evening. to um, look at the sources of the Yes, yeah, so today we are looking at the sources of the eyelid and the conjunctiva, some of the common um, issues that we have presenting to us. So as I said, we'll start with a basic um, a further breakdown of the anatomy and physiology. So since um, um, we are looking at the conjunctiva, we'll look at a little of the applied anatomy one more time before we continue. Okay. So the, the conjunctiva has two main layers. Okay, so the conjunctiva is the mucous membrane, basically that is covering the eye. And it has two main layers. You have the epithelial layer and the stroma. And beneath this stroma, it's what we call the tenons capsule. It's more like there's a capsule under it. Then below this tenons capsule, we have the episclera, which is a vascular you know, connective tissue that is uh, lining the whole of the eyeball or the whole of the, um, the, the sclera itself. That's the conjunctiva. So that means that if you take the eyeball, the first tissue you find on it is the connective tissue, which we call the episclera. Then from there, you see the conjunctiva and this conjunctiva we said the um the lower layer is called the stroma and the upper layer is called the 
epithelial layer. So that, that, that's the two layers. So from top, you have epithelial layer, stroma, um, tenons capsule, episclera, okay? Now the conjunctiva lines the inner surface of the tarsal plates and eyelids. And the, that's what we call the palpebra conjunctiva. The eyelids are also referred to as the palpebra, palpebra. So let me get my tesa. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hope you can see my tesa. So the eye, other name for the eyelids is palpebra. So the part of the conjunctiva that lines the eye, uh, the uh, inner surface of the eyelids is called the palpebra conjunctiva. And then where it falls over in the corners of the uh, uh, of the eyelid. That's the fornis. You have the fornicial conjunctiva. And then where it falls onto the eyeball itself, we call it the barbar conjunctiva. So basically, you can say that the conjunctiva has is made up of two layers, but where it lines the eye, we have the palpebral aspect, the fornicial aspect, and then the barbar conjunctiva. So look at the picture here. There's one picture. Good. All right. So now this entire uh, diagram here is our eyeball. So our eyeball, ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So as you can see, this is the eyeball here, okay? Now, a few things I want you to note. Now this, from this corner here, can you see this corner here? This corner here and this corner here. They are the extents of the external eye that we see. Okay. So what we are saying is that the conjunctiva lines the uh, palpebral conjunctiva, and this is the fornicial conjunctiva, and this is the bulba aspect. This is the bulba aspect. Now, note carefully. So this is our conjunctiva here. I hope you can all see it here. Now, note that. The conjunctiva does not come to the cornea. This is the cornea of the eye. So we have our sclera, which is the white part of the eye. Then the transparent part, which is the cornea. Okay. And, and then the sclera here again, and our conjunctiva here. Now note that the conjunctiva ends at a point. It ends at the junction between the sclera and the cornea. I hope this is clear for everyone. The junction or the point where the sclera meets the cornea is termed as the limbus. Limbus. So this is the limbus. Yeah. There's a cross section. So you see it as if there are two, but it's a continuous spherical junction. So this is the limbus here. This is our limbus here. And you can see the conjunctiva starts from the limbus, goes up onto the sclera, falls in the phonics. This is the upper phonics, and then falls under the palpebra conjunctiva. The same thing here, it falls onto the sclera, into the fornicial um, conjunctiva, and this is the palpebra conjunctiva. So there's a bulba conjunctiva. So therefore, question 13, the uh, conjunctiva covers the cornea or the entire anterior surface of the eyeball, true or false? Then you should be able to know that this one is and throw. All right. Um, okay, so once we are here, we can just look at more of the anatomy as we discussed the other time. So um, the whole of our eyeball, we have uh, um, an outer fibrous layer. Then we have a middle pigmented layer. And then we have the inner um, uh, neural tissue, which is the retina. So the retina, the uvea, and the sclera. Okay. And this obviously is our lens. We have our anterior chamber here. We have our posterior chamber also here. This, uh, all of this fluid here is termed as the aqueous humor. We have the vitreous humor, the macula and the rest. Look at them later. Uh -huh. So I mentioned also the episclera. So the episclera is the connective tissue that is lying just on top of the eyeball right so we proceed okay 
How do I even close this? This is sitting on my. Uh, oh boy, I can't even see my head. Okay. Yeah, so as we continue, so I said that the palpebral conjunctiva starts from the mucocutaneous junction and is firmly adherent to the tarsal plate. That is the, the under surface of the eyelid. So to examine the conjunctiva in the palpebral aspect, you have to evade the eye. I remember when we were kids, we used to evade our eye and then they say the house fly lands on it, it will never go back. You know, so you need to evade that eye um, when you want to examine the conjunctiva. So the furnisher conjunctiva is loose and redundant and thrown into folds. The bubble conjunctiva is loosely attached to the underlying tenons capsule and ends at the limbus where it is firmly attached. So I've already showed you the limbus. Where is my limbus? Limbus, where are you? Yes. So I've told you that the junction here is the limbus. We'll get another picture that will make it more clear. So the conjunctiva ends here. Right. Okay. Now, the conjunctiva epithelium at the limbus is continuous with the corneal epithelium and is responsible for replacing lost corneal epithelial cells. So what you are saying is that this cornea here, this is our cornea, the transparent part of the anterior eye, this cornea, where the uh, bubble conjunctiva ends at the, um, the limbus here. The cells there are responsible for replacing the worn out, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, cells on the, uh, uh, on the cornea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's stroma. So we said that it has an epithelial layer in the stroma. So we've talked about the function of the epithelial layer. Now the function of the stroma is that it contains numerous glands, mucoid secreting glands and goblet cells and accessory lacrimal glands, which contribute to the TFO. So the lower layer of the conjunctiva has the um, mucoid secreting cells or what we call the goblet cells that also help or contribute to the secretions that we have lying in the eye, ensuring that the eye is always um, moist. Yeah. Um, so extensive damage to the conjunctiva can lead to dryness because um, when there's extensive damage that affects these goblet cells or so the stroma layer, okay? So I can ask you which of these, a uh, damage to which of the following parts of the conjunctiva can lead to dryness of the eye. A, epithelium, B, furnitia conjunctiva, C, stroma. I mean, you should know that, isn't it? Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Now there's another picture I put here to show you what I mean by the limbs. Now, as you can see, this is the whole of the eyeball. This whole area is the transparent part. Probably cannot appreciate it. Now, what I said is that the whole of the sclera, it meets the cornea at the limbus. So the whole of this margin here is the limbus. Can you all see the limbus? So the limbus is all of this point. So you realize that if it's a cross section, it's a coronal section, it looks like the limbus is up and down here. But when you look at it properly in, uh, from an anterior view, you realize that it is the whole junction where the white part of the eye meets the transparent part of the eye. That is what I mean by the limbus. I hope it's clear. And the last time I was saying that this thing here, this pink thing, that is entering in front of the lens is the iris and is responsible for the eye color. The space between the iris is called the pupil. And that is what is translated here. So this brown thing here is the iris. The space between it is the pupil. Okay. So the iris is responsible for eye color and it's either contracts, I mean, constricts or dilates to give you the size of the pupil. 
So I hope that Limbus at this point is clear. Good. Mm. Okay, so there's another picture here. You can see our eye. We have the upper eyelid, the lower eyelid. We have the iris here. We have the pupil here. The limbus is all of this junction. This is all of the limbus. Mm -hmm. Then we have our um, media cantus here. We have our lateral cantus here. And we have our yeah, we have our uh, caruncle also here. Yeah. Okay. And of course, the puncta where the eye, um, the tears are drained into the lacrimal duct is also shown here. Okay. So now we'll go to uh, some of the disorders that we commonly have with the eyelid. Okay, so um, we will focus on some of the tumors that we have. And when we talk of tumors, of course, we're always looking at benign and malignant tumors. So for the benign ones, we look at papilloma, we look at the limbal dermoid, lipodermoid, and the navel. For the malignant, we'll look at the squamous cells, the malignant melanoma, lymphoma, kaput sarcoma. And degenerative lesions will look at the uh, pinguiculum and the region. Pinguiculum and the region. All right. Okay. Oh dear. Why is my this thing? Why the IT? If I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So, um, there are things on my screen that I don't know how to. Of, um, why is the thing the the bar at the top? It's not good. Hmm? That's the name. All right. So, we'll start off with the nevus. Okay. So uh, nevus is basically a hyperpigmented patch that we can have on the on the um, sclera, typically on the sclera, and it's usually um, just a limba in that it's it's um, um, close to the limbus. So you can see that this this eye, the limbus, is somewhere here, and we have here what we call our Nevus. It's just like the black spots that we have on our palms and other aspects of the body that we call a birth mark today. Those black, black spots. It's a similar thing that we have on the eye. And of course, they're usually um, benign. So it's just a hyperpigmented spot on the eye. I mean, you see it's commonly around. I'm sure one or two of you should have this one. Okay. Now, the... Oh, I'm sorry. So it presents usually first time in the first two decades. So that's up to about 20 years. And you can see that it is well demarcated. Okay. And will be slightly raised, like a small patch on the sclera. Okay. And frequently, as I said, it's juxta limba. Juxta limba means that it's just next to the limbus. Juxta limba. Okay. And 30% are almost non pigmented. You can see that some of them, the pigmentation in there is very small. So they're usually benign. However, for all benign tumors, when they are becoming malignant, you realize that they begin to have some changes. So, this one, for instance, the features that we have used to describe it as being benign, when it's converting to malignancy, though very rare, you realize that it will lose the well defined margins that it has. All right then may even increase in size or rapidly change in size. Those are the things that will make you worry. Otherwise, when a patient reports to you with this, you tell them to relax it is that, all right? Unless they've noticed drastic changes in it, they don't have to worry. Okay, now, so 
um, this is a Pibaba demo. So sometimes you'd also see a smooth, small, well-defined mass, okay, on the anterior aspect of the eye or on the bulba, okay? And it's usually a soft, smooth mass. Note, it is a soft, smooth mass. And it usually presents in childhood, okay? And it's commonly known to be associated with what we call the golden hair syndrome. Golden hair syndrome, which I'm sure most of you will go and um, read a little some more about. So you can see all these pictures. I could easily bring them in an exam and actually to identify them. And I'm sure it wouldn't be troublesome at all for those of you who have been coming to class. Yes. Anyway, good. The other growth, another type of growth that we can have on the uh, on the eye is the um, papilloma. Okay, the papilloma. Now I'm, I'm sure you are noting the difference between all these various structures that we are going to look at and tell me they are all the same. There's a nevus, you can see it's a hyperpigmented, uh, well-defined um, um, lesion on the, on, the, uh, on the eyelid, I mean on the bulbar conjunctiva. And this is also a smooth, well-defined soft mass. Okay. Now this here is a papilloma. Now, papilloma is, here is a group on the eye. And typically, wherever we see papilloma, whether in general surgery, in um, colon tumors or whatever, we have the pedunculated and the sessile. The sessile ones are the flat ones, and the pedunculated ones are the ones that grow out, you know, seem to have a mound, sort of. So the... Um, uh, so, okay, so we have here a pedunculated one. So you can see this whole mass here. This is a papilloma on the eye. And you can see here, this is a sessile one. This one is very flat. This one is flat on the eyelid. So usually it presents in childhood or early adulthood. And due to most of the time infection with human papilloma virus, HPV. All right, so you may have it multiple or you may have it um, um, bilateral, uh, what do you call it? Bilateral on both eyes. That is the typical feature for the pedunculated ones. For the sessile ones, usually present in middle age and are not often due to an infection. So you'd either see it single, uh, I mean, most of the time you see it as single and unilateral. Okay. All right. Okay. So this one is a very um, gross one. Okay, the same papilloma. This one, I'm sure you can also see there's a related papilloma, but this one is very florid and it's occurring in a patient who is immunocompromised. So if you have an HIV patient having this problem, most likely, um, this is how you are going to see it very, very Okay. All right. Okay. So this one here is what we call a lipothermoid. I don't know if you can all see this soft tissue, which is covering the whole of this corner here, sort of creeping onto the eye. And lipodermoids usually present in adults. They are soft, movable subconjunctiva mass. So it's like a, you know, a soft tissue mass. Unlike the epibulbar dermoid, which is that small, soft, roundish one, this one is more like a blanket rolling over the eye. So it's a double tissue. Okay. And it's usually. Similar. you'd have to go in for excision of um, the various nodules that are on the eye 
And then you can give some chemotherapy in the form of mitomycin C. These are eye drops that can be used. And then if it is florid like this, where you can see that it's metastasized all the way to the, all of the eyelid and parts of the face like this, then that one, you move the whole of the eyeball, excise the whole thing out. and do it. So most of these things, the reason why we are having a lot of pictures for these conditions are that most of them are based on spot diagnosis. Okay. Clear neoplasia or carcinoma institute. So this is where you are having a, a very early um, cancer that hasn't metastasized and it's just limited to that area. So this is what you call intrapilial neoplasia. So over here, you can see that this, oh, onto the eye, okay? And then, um, uh -huh. so the same thing also here, you can see that this one is quite vascular. So these ones, they present in late adults, unlike the benign ones that are present much more earlier. And you'd see a vascular mass. And then as it proceeds, it becomes more vascular and then begins to spread onto the cornea. So if you're having, uh, I mean, a tissue, um, um, which is you know going to cover the eyelid. I'll show you how the well when you get the slides you can compare it more. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this here is a squamous cell carcinoma. So if you're having eventually becomes a carcinoma, a full-blown carcinoma. This is how it looks like. Prone. It can arise out of nowhere or it can come in from intraepithelial neoplasia. So you realize that this is probably a, a pre-existing carcinoma in situ. And then it has uh, um, become malignant. And it's frequently just a limbo, a slow growing, I mean, uh, spread extensive, yeah, but it doesn't often um, spread much. So, treatment, as I mentioned, you can give my to my CC, but these treatments are not for you. proceed to attempt to treat them. When you pick up these conditions, apart from the benign ones that we said are fine, the other ones, if you are not sure or they look suspicious, you will have to refer to an ophthalmologist to assess and determine whether it is benign or malignant. Good. So mitomycin C, 5 fluoro you are so are some of the drugs that I use. Sometimes they do ex surgical excision and cryotherapy if the tumor is big. And sometimes they can they may have to do an inflation and exenteration for advanced case. That is removing of the entire um, eyeball. So then I could pose a scenario that Kwekumenu um, presented with um, a growth on the eye. Outline the features you look out to determine whether it's benign or malignant, and your and your uh, what do you call it? your management plan. Mm -hmm. So based on all that we have said so far, you should be able to look at the features to describe whether it's likely malignant or whether it's likely benign. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kaposi Sakuma. I'm sure by now, whenever I hear Kaposi Sakuma, 
your mind goes to HIV. So it's the HIV. most common cancer. Pardon? Hey, was someone talking? Okay, so when you hear Kapusa sarcoma, you go, your mind goes to HIV. It's the most common cancer that we have among HIV AIDS people. Now, typically, this one is a very vascular, um, slow-growing tumor. The good thing is that it's sensitive to radiotherapy. And most frequently, you see it in the inferior phonics of the eye, the inferior phonics of the eye, okay, of the conjunctiva. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture of how a lymphoma looks like on the on the eye. Okay. Now we're going to another um, benign tumor we have on the uh, conjunctiva. This is a pinguiculum. Now this is a raised yellowish white lesion found on the barbar conjunctiva adjacent to the nasal or temporal limbus. So when we say nasal or temporal limbus, we mean the aspect of the limbus close to the temporal bone or the temporal region of the head and the part of the limbus close to the nose, the nasal limbus, that's what we are saying. When you do histology, you see degeneration of the collagen fibers of the conjunctiva stroma, thinning of the valine conjunctiva and occasional calcification. Pinguicoli may be slow growing. Occasionally, they may become inflamed and cause irritation and foreign body sensation of the eye. Most of the time, you don't necessarily have to excise them. Mm. Okay. Now this one here is a pterygium. Hey. Oh, where's my picture? Oh, sorry. It looks like I missed the picture of the pinguiculum, but I'll add it before I give you the slides. Okay, I forgot. So you'd see it's something like how the nibus is, but this one is a yellowish, um, yellow to whitish um, structure on the eye. So I'll add it to the slide before I give it to you. Okay. Now, pterygium. So as you can see that we have this fleshy tissue that is moving from the sclera onto the, um, onto the uh, cornea. Mm -hmm. So um, risk factors are typically sun exposure and recurrent dry eyes, okay? So people work in the sun and also like, let's say, for instance, a carpenter or woodworker who usually has um, uh, works in the sun, exposed to a lot of dust and all that on the eye. That's what you see. And those are the risk factors for this pterygium. Then if you examine, you'd see a wing shape or a triangular lesion. You can see that this is more like a triangle here. Okay. And then it is raised and fleshy and extending from the sclera to the cornea, basically. Like I said, the reason for all these pictures are that most of these conditions are by spot diagnosis. Hmm. Okay. So signs and symptoms of pterygium are that uh, most are very small and asymptomatic. Some may become inflamed, resulting in a red eye and cause you to feel like there's sand on your eye and there's irritation and watering. Some may also include all the way to cover the pupillary area. They may also cause abnormalities in cornea wetting, leading to daily information at the peripheral cornea and ocular discomfort. They may cause distortion and astigmatism. When we get to um, Refractory errors, you realize that the smooth surface of the cornea helps us in refraction or helps us to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we have what you call a pseudo pterygium. Now you realize that this uh, pterygium here, oh, this pterygium here is adherent on the, uh, what do you call it? On the bubble conjunctiva all the way along its length. But the pseudo pterygium, 
they will look as if it has jumped from here and entered on the sclera. So there's more like space under it. So it's not attached across the whole of its length. Okay. So a true pterygium is adherent to the underlying structures throughout. A pseudo pterygium is fixed only at its apex to the cornea. All right. So it's like it's moved from the sclera and jumps onto the cornea. It's not attached throughout. It is formed no, by no. the adhesion of. Yes. We have uh, less than a minute, so I may have to end the session and then start again. We have a few All seconds right. to end. Yes, though. Okay. Um, all right, though.